You're now tuned in to the Desire to Trade podcast, a show where we bring you the best figures of the trading world and teach you how you can become a successful trader. This is your host, Etienne Kret. Hey, what's up, Trader? It's Inkra here from Desire to Trade, and welcome to episode 58 of the Desire to Trade podcast. I really hope you took something out of the interview with Van Tarp last week. This is a great one, and I know there's a lot of things you could implement easily in your trading, so I really recommend you check this out. Now, this week, the episode is different. It's with someone that I also respect, and I found him through the International Traders Expo. What I really like about Paul Wallace is his focus on performance. And he helps people to have a performance mindset whenever they go into trading. Now, I strongly believe this is important, and that's why I brought him on the show. So we'll go on with this interview with Paul Wallace, and I'll come back at the end with the takeaways. Paul Wallace, welcome to the Desire Street Podcast. How are you doing today? Hello, Etienne. I'm very well, thank you. And yourself? Yeah, very good. Thank you. So we're recording this just to give a bit of background. We're recording this a little bit after Brexit. So it's been, I think, a few weeks yep. now. But this podcast can be published only around September. But I want you to tell us what did you take on Brexit? Sure. Um, I uh, well, there's, there's quite a lot to cover there. It's uh, what well, it's, it's the seventh of July that we're talking on, so it's been a couple of weeks since. You know, I uh, you know I, I wrote quite extensively on my blog in the in the run up to it and, and over it and since, and uh, it's been quite. I mean, it's history in the making. That's what I think. You know, maybe people are realizing that we've actually got history in the making. You know, if, if you look at this from a you know, financially, from a culturally, uh, politically, you know, from the markets, pretty much from every sphere of life that's had an impact on the. I myself, you know, I, I admit that I was a vote leave for my own reasons, but I also said that I, I never actually thought it would happen. I remain crowd had the money, the power, the media, the establishment behind it. And so I, I felt that the remain group would win and it would just be a case of the margin of victory. So in some respects, it became, it came as just as much a shock to me that it uh, happened as to, uh, to anybody else. But then, you know, reading after the aftermath, you know, you know, even, you know, number 10 Downing Street, you know, the major institutions, the European Union itself, the uh, George Soros, even they were all uh, sort of long and wrong in terms of the look on Sterling at that time. So I think a lot of people got caught on the wrong side of that in terms of the initial move. And I have no doubt we'll, um, the stories about that will start to come out. And since then, it's been messy, you know, in terms of politically. But my own view is, you know, I still stick to my own view is that, you know, there was always going to be, you know, a couple of years of pain and adjustment. But in the long term, it'll be better for the UK. And this kind of, let's say, this volatility has uh, provided some very nice trading opportunities over the last week or so. And this is going to be sort of a prediction. And we don't like to predict necessarily as traders because that's not the mm -hmm. point. But what do you think is going to happen with trading? With trading in terms of how it affects affects trading globally or, or how it will affect retail traders? It's a pretty um, big question. I yes, think. Yeah. So I suppose, what about retail traders? For retail traders, I don't think it's going to make a, a massive amount of difference. You know, there's a lot of hype and hype hysteria at the moment, but, you know, the world still turns, the sun still rises. It's, you know, in terms of retail traders, you know, what they have had the opportunity to do is to, is to watch history in the making and to watch how that has uh, affected markets. And I suppose the lesson I would want retail traders to take away is, you know, this is exactly why risk management is so absolutely key, you know, because I have no doubt that there was a lot of uh, you know retail traders who probably were trying to trade all of those volatile moves, especially you know, as it happened overnight during the day. And they probably got washed out either on... Uh, you know, terrible spreads or, you know, excess slippage or just poorly filled or not not filled at all. And so, uh, you know, when events like this happen, and they do happen, you know, right? they, they happen, they happen much more than we like to think that, um, you know, the best thing you can be done is to always be managing risk. And, and when an event like that happens, for most retail traders, for most retail traders, the best thing they can do is actually sit on their hands, let all of the absolute sort of kind of the blood and thunder pass through and then look to trade the aftermath because that's where the real opportunities will be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know a couple of people who went to try to trade Brexit and it didn't work out mm -hmm. great, but it doesn't mean it worked. But yeah, I think it's better not to try it all. Yeah. And certainly all my clients, I had advised them to be flat, um, sterling and sterling exposure, running into the sort of uh, the day of the vote and, and such. And even in the week beforehand, I myself was kind of had effectively just you know uh, unloaded sterling positions and was just completely flat any sterling exposure going into because you know the, just the volatility is just immense and and that's what we've seen and 
you know, the truth of the matter is, as a retail trader, you're at the bottom. You know, you're at you're at the bottom of the uh, let's say of the kind of the fishing and the food chain, and and so you know, invariably you're going to invariably get to the, you know the worst fills, you know, the biggest slippage, the you know the worst execution, etc. So you know, the, for most people, the best thing they can do is just sit on their hands and stay out of it. All right. Yeah, yeah, it did move. You know, yeah, sterling did move down from, and I was sat on a trading floor overnight in London. You know, I watched it double top head and shoulders there on, on at 150 and then collapse you know but the reality is that most retail traders wouldn't have been in the position to be able to really take advantage of it in a meaningful way mm-hmm. all right so we'll get into the usual interview this is was like a, a part for a special event but we'll get into the real interview and i'll start by asking you what is one quote that inspires you one quote that inspires me well there's many but i suppose with regards to trading there's an ed Cicota quote that says everybody gets what they want from the markets and you know when i first heard it like 15 years ago i thought oh yeah that's very nice it's very profound very sage you know sage words of wisdom there but actually uh, the longer i have traded the longer i have uh, been around other traders the longer i've coached traders the more i realize the the validity of what he said then uh, that everybody does get what they want from the markets right and uh, what you begin to realize is that what people you know, want from the markets isn't always what they say it is. And quite often what people want from the markets, they don't really know themselves. You know, people might say that, you know, that they want profits from the market, but actually if you find out that some people, you know, some people want action, some people want distraction, some people want validity, some people want to, you know, to, to have their ego stroked, you know, but some people want pain. You know, the more you do it, the more you realize that everybody gets what they want from the markets. And yeah, you need to know in yourself, in your heart, what it is that you want from the markets because you're going to get it one way or another. Mm-hmm. I heard the quote a few times, but this one is really well explained for this time. So that's, that's awesome. Yeah. So welcome. what exactly are you doing these days? Primarily, most of my uh, trading these days is kind of longer term trading on, on for my own account. I'd say it's probably about 90% of it is a mixture of longer term positions and swing trades and then a little bit of opportunistic intraday trading when I know I'm at my desk for a period of time. So, But primarily, that's the majority of my trading work. And then I still have you know institutional and corporate clients that I work with in terms of um, you know, helping manage trader performance. And then I do a little bit of helping manage and improve trader performance you know, for prop traders and high net worth clients and, uh, and a couple of, uh, a couple of sort of private retail, tra- a couple of private retail traders as well. So, um, so yeah, there's plenty to keep me going. Yeah. So yeah, so that's a lot. That's, that's mm-hmm. awesome. And the question people also have is how did you start trading exactly? How did I start? Well, it's kind of a long story now. It goes back to the 1990s. And I was a serving officer in the Royal Air Force. And in particular, I, my job was fighter controller, sort of a, what they call an air battle manager these days. And what happened was that the, uh, a few of the, well, one of the, a couple of the banks in the city were trying to poach guys doing my job in the Air Force to, to go and be traders on the bank floors during the, uh, uh, you know, for traders on their bank floors. There's seem to be a lot of very similar skill sets, um, you know, just the ability to be calm under pressure and the mental agility and ability to make a plan and execute and see it through and, you know, and a whole host of other things. And they, you know, it kind of piqued my interest. And I think the banks actually did, I think a couple of the banks went and did a few uh, studies on air traffic controllers down at Heathrow, from what I understand. And it was a little bit strange that the, the air traffic controllers struggled a bit because air traffic controllers, by their very nature, are uh, they're very risk averse. It's their job to keep aircraft apart. And so they are naturally very, very risk averse. Whereas a fighter controller, uh, his job is to engage with the enemy and, and shoot the other side's bomber aircraft. So attacking a position or being able to pull the trigger is not a problem. It's not a problem that fire controllers have. So, yeah, so that's kind of how it started to pique my interest. And eventually I transitioned out of the military at the end of the 90s and found myself working in, uh, found myself working in the city in London, uh, actually sort of uh, on the kind of internet and telecoms during the dot-com boom. And I was just, to be honest, I was, I was bored in my job, absolutely uh, bored in my job. And so I started to just trade internet stocks around my day job. And I started kind of making more money from that than I did from my my day job. And so um, I was very lucky, though. You know, I tell people, you know, when I look at those trades now, I was just a lucky gambler, really. You didn't really have to be that good to make money, you know, in the the late 90s, especially because I knew the sector. 
and understood the sector and internet and telecom, you know, you really, you just, you know, you, you just bought other stocks in an internet and telco sector and, and they went up and then you got out. So I was very lucky. And as I tell people, my kind of my uh, greatest stroke of luck was that um, I got out about a week before it all crashed in uh, sort of February, March 2000. So um, I, uh, yeah, but that, as I said, that was luck. There was no real, you know, analysis or anything. I was just very, very lucky. But what happened is the seed was sown and it kind of got my interest in trading. And then I managed to get voluntary redundancy from my company and the money I'd made from trading and with, the, and with my redundancy payment, uh, I was, uh, was able to start trading for myself. And just this was about the same time as FX markets had just become available to the, let's say, the retail crowd, which was kind of about 2003. And yeah, just one thing led to another, really. So um, yeah, that's how I started anyway. Yeah. And did you ever sort of crash at some point? Because you were basically the state where you felt confident about your ability to trade, right? Did that keep going or did you fall like fall short at some point? <laughs> I can, I've never like, uh, I've never blown an account or anything like that. So, and um, I'll come back to the first part of the question. But I've, I've never blown an account because uh, one of the things I took over from the military was that, you know, especially as a battle manager, is that you're, you know, you're always looking to live to fight another day. You know, that's, that's what you're trying to do. So you become intuitively very, very good at managing risk. And so, you know, from right from the word get even from when I started demo trading, I never, ever traded without, you know, having a stop loss in place or without, you know, just risking a very, very small portion of my account to, you know, on a, on a particular trade. So even when I did have a string of loss or cluster of losses, what I now know is just a, you know, a standard cluster of losses, you know, I was always able to live to fight another day. And that's what allowed me to basically survive that, um, you know, what is what is truthfully quite a brutal learning curve for you know for for most new retail for most new retail traders. But um, to answer the first part, I, you know, I can. Um, what I did was I set myself a uh, set myself a goal that I started off on demo trading FX markets because all my experience in the past had been on equities, just literally, almost just like a kind of a shortened version of buy and hold, you know, equities, and so. Um, FX was new to me, and so I said, "Right, okay, uh, I'll do demo for a few weeks." And and once I put a, like a, a four weeks of consistent profit, week after week, then I'll sort of transition across to live trading. Yeah, I did that, and I, you know, and I can still even even after all these years, even after all these years, I can <laughs> I can still remember it was like my kind of my first day of live trading FX markets. All those like years ago was uh, I used to tr- sit in an office with her and trade with a South African guy and. Uh, I had two trades, like you know, pound against dollar and euro against dollar, and I think I made it was like 174 pips on on my first two live trades, you know, ever. And you know, I remember sort of thinking, you know, this is fantastic, <laughs> this is uh, brilliant, you know. Step aside, Soros. Step aside, Tudor Jones is a new boy in town, and 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 we did really, really well. And what happened was, um, as we did well, we started to add more instruments, you know, started then started to. Add in like uh, gold and add in. It was the only time I really traded oil and a couple of equities, and you know it was going well. But then it stopped going well, you know, and, and it literally, you know, we started to take. You know, what I now know is just a cluster of losses. But at that time, it was just you know, as a case of you know, like uh, what we'd say in the UK is like you know, you, you touch a desert, you know, your purple patch was over. And so you know, we pulled back. You know, I pulled back just to focusing on FX. But as I said, part of that, part of that was to do with the fact that because Right from the off, I'd only ever, you know, risked a small portion on any trade and also never, ever traded without a stop loss in place and never moved stop loss, never, you know, anything like that. It was just, you know, my job was always to live to fight another day. So even when I did have a string of losses, I was able to still turn up next day and, and trade because I'd managed risk accordingly. And I recognize that is probably one of the big things that allowed me to sort of ride out that kind of, let's say, that brutal learning curve. And, you know, help me to be where I am today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense, though, because so many people jump in unprepared to trading, right? They don't have any precaution. But if you jump with the right, like, precaution with the right tools, I guess it's a lot easier to get through. Yes. You know, the, you know and of course, you know, I've, I've learned massively, you know, over, over these last good few years. And the truth of the matter is, if you're not managing risk, you're going to be roadkill. It's as simple as that, right? It's as simple as that. You know, the managing risk is your is your number one job, right? And and that has to be the absolute crux of what of what you're doing. Okay, and um, you know, as, as, the, as you realise, is that you know, amateurs are always thinking about how much money they can win, and professionals are always thinking about how much money they can lose, and ultimately, professionals always take money from amateurs. 
that's uh, that's the nature of the game. And so you mentioned the fact that you're now helping people go from the military to trading, right? Yeah, that's um, what I realized was that over the last few years, I was getting contacted by quite a few um, veterans, um, you know, wanting to, to understand about trading. And kind of interesting, when I was chatting to them about why, what was their driver, it, it kind of a lot of that resonated with me as in, you know, the, these guys and girls, especially over the last, let's say, 10 years, where, you know, where there's been plenty going on in the world, you know, they spent their early youth, you know, in, uh, let's say, in dangerous places. And they feel as if, you know, they don't really want anything, but they, but they earn the right to do what they want for the rest of their days. And a lot of them are now thinking, well, you know, I, I found the challenge of trading, which, to be fair, is exactly how I felt when I left the Air Forces. You know, I wanted, you know, I wanted another good challenge. And I really always fancied ending up on a trading floor. I fancied that the challenge of that. But what I realized was that, you know, I wanted to try and leverage their existing skill sets and utilize that as the, uh, call it like the building blocks of, you know, helping them transition across to being you know good effective traders and i saw you know a couple you know, about two years ago i saw a uh, basically a fund manager talking about how you know what were the things that basically identified great traders again and again and again in all her time and, you know from like either actually you know, working with traders and fund managers or coaching them or helping them etc and she said you know there's three things they kept coming back to which was a uh, process discipline and self-awareness uh, and they, these three things kept showing up you know time and time again in the sort of let's say the, the demographics of good traders you know i agree i agree absolutely I agree absolutely 100 percent with that it's also one of the things that veterans tend to do very well they tend to be very good at following a process they tend to be very good at being disciplined enough to follow a process and one of the things that it actually helped me and i'm very big on and it's very is a real part of the kind of let's say the military chain is is about having increased and raised self-awareness. So you spend so much time, so much time like debriefing a mission to extract as much training value as you can out of it. That it just becomes your natural way of life to debrief constantly. And so in trading, that becomes a really crucial element in that, you know, every time you debrief a trade, you know, if it's, if it's uh, you know, after the trade is finished, at the end of the day, at the end of the week, at the end of the month, at the end of the quarter, Every time you relive those trades, well, then, you know, you're learning from it. You're doing what you can to accelerate your progress as a trader. So, yeah, so I developed a thing called uh, over the last year or so called the Veterans Trader Project, which was about giving these guys and girls the opportunity to learn about, you know, how to trade markets on the basis of those, let's call it those three elements of process, discipline and self-awareness. And interestingly, what I found was that it turns out that, you know, actually lots of just normal guys and girls who are trading are intrigued to learn and understand about that way of trading and, and recognize that maybe, you know, where their trading endeavors had failed in the past was because that, you know, they had very little in the way of process, discipline and self-awareness. So as I said, those are the kind of building blocks I'm working with to try and help give these guys and girls the sort of insight and backup and support that I never had. I literally was, you know, I literally was firing off in the dark, really. So, um, you know, if it helps them, well, then, you know, I'm chuffed to bits. Mm -hmm. So I definitely want to jump onto those three topics because I see people cutting corners all the time about yeah. process, discipline, self-awareness. But before, yeah. the only thing I'm wondering is, do you find that the, the desire for people in military to take risk is impacting their trading negatively or is it a positive thing? That's a good question. I think they, as I said, I think they're actually intuitively good risk managers meaning that they know when there's a time to push a position and they know when there's a time to run away bravely. And, you know, there has to be a little bit tweaked towards, let's say, the environment of, of a market. But as a, as a general rule, the majority of, let's say, traders who are veterans, they tend to do pretty well. They tend to be quite happy. If they have a simple process to follow, they'll happily follow that. They'll put the trade, you know, pull the trade on a trigger, but they will also manage risk, okay? They will also manage risk in terms of they're not, you know, they only risk a small portion of their account. They're in a never trade without stop loss, especially the ones I've worked with because they become so ingrained into them. You know, certainly all of the exposure I've had is that they are very, very happy and very comfortable embracing risk, but they also have a healthy respect for it as well. Yeah, I guess it's about finding a balance. There is. And I suppose everybody has to find that, don't they, really? Everybody has to find that element of balance. And, you know, I tell people that I can teach people the one thing that, that I can't teach a person is, is to understand their own risk profile. That's something that's innately individual, you know, independent to that individual, okay? And, and understanding, you know, your own risk profile becomes um, hugely important. It's not a case of fighting it. You know, I've got to a, a level where 
I define people either people are either a GBT, a greed based trader, or an FBT, a fear based trader. And it's to a point where I can actually tell just from speaking to a trader, I can actually tell from their language and their body language what type of trader they are. And it's it's not a case of one it's not a case of one is better than the other. It's about understanding who you are and working in alignment with that. You know, don't try and fight, you know, your natural personality because that's never gonna really that's never gonna really, you know, work long term. It's about understanding who you are. And then finding a way to engage in markets that's complementary to your own, you know, personality and character and beliefs. Yeah. So, how would you go for someone to like someone who is looking for like who is fearing the market? How would you go about trading sure. with that stuff? Um, I think if someone's a fear-based trader, and I consider myself to be an FBT, to be a fear-based trader, I would say the key to it is simplicity, simplicity and precision. They need to have an immensely simple entry signal. All right, that uh, doesn't need to be you know convoluted or about twenty things to line up. You know, maybe it might be if three elements come together. That's their entry signal. It needs to be exceptionally simple, and it needs to be precise, as in they know exactly you know where they pull the trigger or where their trade is placed. So that the reason is that is so that there is no opportunity for any ambiguity at that moment, no opportunity for hesitation to step in and, and cause them to doubt whether that trade should go on because invariably a fear-based trader, if doubt arises at that moment of action, they'll utilize that to use it as a means not to pull the trigger. So they just need simplicity and precision to know, you know, that is my signal. And when that happens, I pull the trigger. That's it. That's, you know, you know thinking about it, it's almost like, a, you know, they practice it until it becomes an automatic process. Does that make sense to you at all? Yeah, 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 yeah totally. Yeah. And what about grid-based traders? Would that be more trend following, I'm supposing? Or? Yeah. I don't necessarily think it, not so much as it's trend following greed based traders. That the greed based traders are the ones who tend to go on and make the millions, all right, and tend to make the great fortune. But the reality is they don't, all right. And the reason they don't is that most of them are really terrible risk managers. Most of them are absolutely woeful risk managers. You know, they're always chasing the opportunity rather than rather than actually you know um, managing the opportunity. So with a greed based trader, in a kind of a way, it's almost about simplicity, as in. It needs to be an immensely simple yet robust risk management plan that um, that allows them to, to know exactly what their exit is when they're wrong. And they also know what their trade size is. So there's no opportunity for them to, let's say, uh, you know, put the Ferrari trade on and, and risk you know, 25% of their account on, on one individual trade or something like that. It's about having a simple, robust risk management profile that they can follow trade in trade out regardless of you know whether it's their first trade or it's whether it's their thousandth trade of the year so one of them really focuses on the trading strategy and the other it's more about about risk yeah but you know but then that's that's what you'd explain from a greed based trade uh, that's you know that's where the weakness is and, and invariably for a, a fear based trader you know that they'll look at using any opportunity to, to avoid pulling the trigger and so it's um you make it so simple and so clear cut that there is no ambiguity about what their entry is. So let's jump into process, discipline, and self awareness. Mm. I said it, and I see so many people cutting corners short on, on that topic and really yeah. not having a process or like lacking one of those three. And I think exactly. it causes most of the problem in the end. Uh, yeah, I'd so agree. When we talk of process, what is it exactly? Is this a trading plan or? I think if you can look at it, let's call it almost like a holistic place. So uh, I talk to people about that. They always have to look at trading through the prism of the four M's of trading. So you're looking at markets, method, money, and myself. Those are the four M's of trading that you need to be on top of and you need to manage. When you start to break that down, what you're looking at, you know, initially you need to have like a strategic business plan, right? It's, you know, you're either you're a professional with a business or you're an amateur with a hobby, you know, the, the long and the short of it. So your strategic business plan, and then you know that should give you, you know, let's say your overall way about how you uh, you know build a business. But then invariably you need to break that down to having a tactical trading plan, and that's almost like a little that could almost be like an, an A5 piece of paper that sits next to you that becomes like a checklist that you follow, you know, religiously for every day, every session, every hour, every trade. You know, I tell people I'm a, I'm a huge fan of a book called The Checklist Manifesto, which I get my own clients to read. And invariably, it's about having that simple checklist. And I refer people back to, and, you know, once again, a bit of an aviation sort of analogy that um, then when they get go and get on a flight, you know, you're going to take a flight. But when the pilot turns up, that, that pilot follows a pre-flight checklist, regardless of whether it's his first flight, you know, or whether it's his last flight after a 40-year career, you know, training. He never deviates from that. He never 
interprets it in his own way, okay? He, he follows that checklist religiously. And the reason he does that, because he knows it works, and the reason he does it is because he knows that, you know, it will keep him safe. And so it's the same for, you know, for a trader. Regardless of how you, let's say, you may engage, you know, what kind of part of your creative artist science allows you to have a trade idea, in terms of, you know, you running that as like almost like a tactical trade plan, it, it is almost like a very simple 10-point checklist that you follow, you know, day after day. Trade after trade, you know, that becomes almost you know, that sort of automatic process. And, and by following it, you know, you become disciplined. And by being disciplined, you follow the process. It starts to become quite a self kind of a you know, positive reaffirming cycle that you get yourself into. Mm-hmm. Yeah, checklists have made a huge impact for me as well. And yeah, I use them a lot. So, yeah, it's, it's been a big difference. Yeah, I would recommend anyone read that checklist manifesto and then sit down and create their own. It's um, Checklist Manifesto. It's actually one of many books that is not about trading, but actually any trader who reads it will realize this is all about trading. So mm-hmm. That's awesome. And then what about discipline? Well, you know, part of that, as I said, is if you have a process to follow, then, you know, you're able to, you know, it becomes a lot easier to be disciplined because you have a process to follow. Once you start grading yourself and following that, right, and once you start grading yourself and following that to that process, and there are suitable, um, let's say, suitable carrot and stick elements to that, then it becomes a lot easier to be disciplined. And I think in my own view is that discipline also springs from motivation. You know, if you want to be a world-class, consistently successful, effective trader, well, then, you know, anybody anybody knows that, you know, being disciplined is part of that particular, is part of, you know, is, is just part of the kind of the job spec of doing that. So, you know, if you find yourself not wanting to be disciplined about your trading, well, then, you know, I'd probably be suggesting someone has a little bit of a, uh, you know, they, they go and have a little bit of a period of reflection about whether they really do want to be a trader. You know, do they really want to be a trader? You know, that, and I suppose that's maybe at the harsh end of the spectrum. But, you know, the other bit is if they're not being disciplined and following their, their trading process, well, then, you know, it's a question of, you know, is that the right process? It, could it be a case that, that they're overwhelmed? Could it be a case that they're actually just, you know, mentally fatigued? You know, there's a whole host of kind of elements you could look at. But, you know, if, if their motivation isn't, isn't right, well, then I suspect that, that any ability to try and follow a, uh, to follow, you know, be a discipline and following the process is going to fall on stony ground eventually. And I think this goes back to the quote we started with, right, with Ezekoda. If you want excitement out of trading, then... You're not going to be disciplined, yeah. but if you're not disciplined and you want something else, then it might not be the right thing you want. Actually, if you, if you want a bit of, if you want some action, you know, you're going to get it in the markets. But the reality is, it's probably going to cost you. You know, if you if you want, you know, if you want some excitement and action, well, then you know, buy yourself an Xbox or a PlayStation. And and, and I, I used to do that. I used to do that when I found myself, you know, but you know, early on when I found myself feeling a bit impulsive or as if I just, you know. Wanted to get in a trade, I'd actually go next door and switch the Xbox on and play that for half an hour and, and take out my frustrations there rather than take it out on the market, you know. And, uh, you know, that's, that's why that's what's just has got, you know, here, as I said right at the start, everybody gets what they want. Then the last part is really about self awareness. And I think this is my favorite part, but I'll, mm. I'll let you explain what you think about that. Uh, sure. In, in terms of self awareness, I think that uh, anybody who Let's say intraday trades, live financial markets is going to learn a lot about themselves, the good, the bad, and the ugly. There are lots of people who come into uh, intraday trading for all the wrong reasons, and then they do it very badly, and they tend to get uh, knocked about a bit by the markets, and they uh, tend to maybe, uh, you know, the, maybe their behavior, the, their behavior is perhaps a little bit different than they expected. And, uh, you know, I know plenty of people who, you know, who've come in, with, uh, you know, coming to intraday trading, you know, like a, like a big gunslinger in a cowboy in Western, and, and then within a very short space of time, they've, you know, they've left with their tail between their uh, legs and, and, you know, and, and they never speak about it again because actually what's happened is, you know, they've been kicked about and they've learned a lot about themselves in terms of, you know, the, let's say there's some of the, uh, the, let's say some of the darker sides of their own personality. So, you know, there is always that possibility there. But I think in terms of your self-awareness, you know, as I said, uh, you know, one of the things that, you know, and I, and I appreciate maybe I have been a little bit, um, you know, fortunate maybe in terms of any kind of performance environment. And I've worked in a f- few, not just like fast jet squadrons, any kind of performance environment. There's a real focus on basically re- reviewing performance, being able to debrief it from it. So, you know, 
and having the right environment where you encourage people to be able to stand up and say, you know, I, I made a mistake here. I did, I did ABC. It was a mistake. And, you know, I have learned from that because by that way, everybody gets to learn from it. And also you create the right environment whereby, you know, mistakes aren't to be something that are, you know, that's hidden away under the uh, carpet and never talked about again. You know, it needs to be an open and transparent system. And, and even when you're just trading for yourself, there needs to be that kind of openness and transparency that, you know, if you make a mistake, you know, you're openly transparent about it and, and you utilize it as an opportunity to learn and, and then from that evolve to the next level as a trader. And so one of the things that, you know, I used to do all the time, you know, when I was a very active intraday trader is literally, you know, I would quite literally print off all the charts from my, uh, you know, when the, once the sort of, let's say the London session had kind of petered out about 10 o'clock in the morning. And we go, I print off, you know, all the charts from my, my trades that morning. I would get away from my desk, go and sit in a coffee shop and literally, you know, just rerun through those trades. What, you know, what had I learned? What had I, uh, what had I done well? What had I done wrong? What would I, what could I learn from it? What, how could I adapt? How could I improve from my, my next session? And, and I would always be like, you know, what are the three things I've learned from this trade and utilizing that as a, as a means to basically to reinforce, okay? Sometimes you make a mistake a couple of times, you know, you, by have fortunes to write it down and, and face it, you know, you become a lot quicker at being able to accept it and amend your, amend your behavior. Uh, but also you start to build up a picture of your, of your own character, all right? Um, most traders are the trend followers, but uh, what they don't realize is that, that there will actually be tra- trends within their own behavior as a trader. And what you're looking to try and do is just to identify them yourself so that you can basically build on your strengths and do what you can to mitigate your weaknesses because everybody has their weaknesses. Don't let anybody ever tell you that they don't. It's about, you know, build on your strengths and mitigate your weakness. Yeah, this is it. I think it's really powerful. Makes a lot of sense. And how do you keep track of the thing you learn? You have some sort of journal? Yeah, I'd have, I still have, you know, I have, so basically I would, um, all my trades go into an Excel spreadsheet. Then I would write uh, basically an individual trade journal entry for each of those trades. And that would literally be it's like an A4 page, a process thing that I follow through uh, that also has the uh, attached screenshots from, you know, before the trade was pulled. And then also what happened after the trade was pulled. So. You know, I can look over my shoulder in my office and, you know, and I can, you know, if I need to cheering up, I can go and pull out a, uh, you know, a, a trade sheet from 10 odd years ago and still look at it. And, you know, I can look at uh, how that trade happened and like, you know, you know, what was I thinking? You know, what was I thinking of that trade? That was just clearly very poor. But the flip side of it is it can make me chuckle, but also what it does make me realize is exactly how far I've come, right? It's... um Sometimes people find that very hard to understand because they measure their progress just by the, the P&L of their account. And that, that's not always the best way to work, you know, because then you start linking your self-worth and your self-confidence and your self-belief to your P&L. And that's never, a, uh, that's never a smart way. But by being able to go back and look at what your trades were like six months, a year, five years, 10 years, you can start to look at, you know, you can take a bit of a, an objective perspective on, on exactly how far you've come, what you've learned, how you've developed as both you know, a trader and as a human being. There's a lot of satisfaction to be taken from that as, as you lean towards you know, what you're trying to improve going forward in the future. And I think one of the angriest traders is to just look back, like take a second to look back at how you were a few months ago. Like, even if you're not successful today, yeah. but you look back and see how you progress. Because like, sometimes you made a big difference. Like, Going from trading with no stop loss with trading with the stop loss, like it's already a huge step, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's like you remember I said it's like it's running a business, all right? And any good business has to take an inventory, you know, a couple of times a year to, to understand what they've got, you know. In your own business, you know, your inventory is, you know, it's almost like your past trades and your IP, okay, in terms of what you've you know, what you've learned and, and what you've how you've developed. And if you don't take the time to recognize that, well then you you know, you forget what you've learned. You keep making the same mistakes again and again, unless you can go able to go back and realize that, you know, how far you've come, how far you've developed, how you've changed and, and how you've grown as a person and as a trader. Mm-hmm. So I feel like we've covered a lot, but do you have any other advice for a trader? Advice for traders in general? Well, I, I suppose the vast majority, the vast majority of retail traders, you need to look at managing expectations much better. I think that the truth of the matter is that most retail traders are undercapitalized. Right. You know, so, you know, I, I hear from traders telling me that they're going to give up that, you know, they're, they're fed up with the day job. They're going to give it up and they've got, you know, they've got 10,000 pounds. They can put in a trading account and, they, and they're going to trade for a living and, you know, and everything's going to be great. And so they're always a bit surprised when I tell them that would be a, 
probably a stupid idea and that they shouldn't do it. And so they were always a little bit taken aback by me thinking that I would naturally just uh, encourage them in that behavior. But the reality is most retail traders are undercapitalized. And so, you know, thinking that, you know, you know, thinking that you can, you know, trade for a living of, of £10,000 account, can you do it? Yes, you can. And anything is possible. But in terms of the probabilities of being able to do it, you know, it starts to become, those probabilities start to diminish very, very, very rapidly, you know. And so people are, you know, instead of treating, let's say, you know, 4% a month growth as as something, you know, really great that they can work on and, uh, you know, and, and work towards every every month. You know, you're finding these guys and girls, you know, they, they want 4% growth every day. Now, mm. is that possible? Yeah, I think anything is possible. What's the actual probabilities of achieving that day after day after day? Because you've got to, because you've got to pay rent and you've got to make, you know, pay for your car and your credit card and your phone bills and stuff. The, the reality is it's just going to shred. It's going to shred most people. So, you know, in terms of advice for new traders, if you're thinking of, you know, giving up the day job and trading for a living, my advice would be don't do it. All right, if you hate your job, do something about that, all right? You know, go and get a better job, all right? Or go and change your job and then still trade about it until you're adequately capitalized to be able to do it properly because there's nothing wrong in terms of, you know, um, trading around a day job until you're in a position to trade for opportunity rather than trade for money. As soon as you sit down at, at your trading desk and need to trade for money because you've got to pay rent and bills, you're, you're going to struggle, right? Your decision-making processes will will be skewed. That the pressure will sit on your shoulders. You may not recognise it, but I guarantee it'll be it'll be there. So, you know, do yourself a favour. You know, take a long, hard look at your expectations and and you know, you know, give yourself a chance to succeed. That's right. And the market doesn't care if you want money or not. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The market doesn't care that the market doesn't the market doesn't care that you know you might have I don't know you've got a mortgage payment or you've got you know paying your kids private school tuition but the market doesn't know and the market doesn't care about that and it's not out to necessarily to get you it's, it's just doing its thing but you know if, if you sit down with that kind of level of pressure on your shoulder to and you know and, and let's say you know you you know you're married and you've got you know a spouse and kids at home you know who are depending on you bringing in the bacon then yeah that's not a good place to be that's not a good place to be you know, do yourself a favor you know keep the job you know pay your bills so, you know, have a good family life and, and trade around it okay and, and get better and uh, and then you know and let your account grow and compound and until you're in a position to you know until you are adequately capitalized so uh, that would be uh, maybe that's not that, that might not be very inspiring advice but it's the brutal truth of it unfortunately yeah, but if people do it right, it's just going to come, and they're going to be able to do it eventually. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, how can people find you exactly? Well, you know, I write a, a blog, so uh, which is about my own trading. So that's uh, fxtraderpool.com. So um, I put on my uh, my thoughts. Sometimes I put on some of my trades. Sometimes I put on my views in the market. Sometimes I just put on my rants. And so. Uh, uh, they can look at that on Twitter. It's at FX Trader Paul. For those, for example, those who are in the UK or in the South UK, I run the London Traders Network on meetup.com and I run like six social evenings a year. Uh, I think the next one's Thursday, July 21st. It is quite literally, um, I, uh, you know, I, I sort of kind of arrange for us to have a, have a bar and it's uh, traders of all walks of uh, life can just come and get out from behind the screens, can have a, a beer and a chat and stuff. It doesn't matter whether you've been trading for two weeks or two decades, just, you know, come have a beer, have a chat, share your all stories, you know, actually engage in some uh, kind of geeky trader chat rather than uh, rather than boring your, your nearest and dearest with your tales of fighting you know, dollar yen on an intraday basis. So yeah, so that's, that's probably the, the best ways that people could have a look or follow me. Pretty cool. And just small for instance, we do the same thing in Montreal. So you should oh, really? Montreal, check us out. Yeah, well, that's every, every single go. month. So yeah. Excellent. There you go. There, there is a lot of value to it. There is a lot yeah, of value yeah, a lot. to yeah. getting out from behind the screens and just going and being able to chat with someone who understands, you know, what you're going through, whether you're having a good time or a bad time. You know, you know another trade is likely to understand it far better than anybody else. You know, yeah, yeah, and, totally. Yeah. So it's good for you, and it's good for you to get it off your chest. So, Paul, what goes there for the future exactly? For myself, well, <clears throat> at the moment, I mean, see, I, uh, I'm in Cheshire at the moment, but I pretty much have been splitting my uh, time between Dublin and London. In a post-Brexit world, I am uh, presently sort of deciding whether to go back to Dublin or whether to go back to London full time. The reality is I suspect that I'll probably go back to London full time. And uh, I, have a, I have a couple of, uh, I have a couple of, 
fund management opportunities that are coming across my desk. I, I used to work for hedge funds years um, years ago, and I might investigate them, but um, the people are always a bit surprised. They think that you know being like a fund manager is the, you know, is the greatest job ever, but I tell people that you know be careful what you wish for. Being a good trader and being a good money manager are, are in some respects, in some respects, very different skill sets. So, uh, we'll see. so if I do that, that'll be good, but I'll still continue to run the uh, the Veterans Trader Project, the things like the London Traders Network. And I have a couple of other businesses and a couple of other uh, ongoing concerns. So uh, that, um, you know, and that's what I'll work forward with them at the end. And what is your main motivation to do all this? Interestingly, it is uh, autonomy is uh, is probably my driver. I, I, I would say that's my main driver is that I get to live life by my own rules. Okay, I've I've, uh, I've spent my time in the military. I've been a corporate boy as well. I've I've worked, you know, I've worked for you know forty one hundred companies. I worked for you know small startups, etc. So I have had uh, plenty of experience of working for other people. And uh, actually, I uh, much prefer the autonomy of of being able to live and work and, and operate by my own rules rather than by anybody else's. So, Paul, I just want to remind the listeners that all the show notes are going to be on desertory.com. So, if people want to find the links we talked about and if they want to find you, you just have to check out desertory.com. They're going to be able to find everything. Sure. And, yeah. Paul, I have one last question for you, which I ask every single guest. And that is sometimes tricky a little bit. But if you could give only one sentence of advice for traders, what would that one sentence of advice be? Uh, always manage risk. Powerful, powerful. It's all about risk. I love it. So mm -hmm. Paul Wallace, thanks a lot for being on the podcast. It's been a pleasure to have you here. And for all pleasure. the listeners of the next episode. All right, guys. So this is definitely an interview I'll listen back to a couple of times. I think there's a lot of pieces of advice here. I won't talk about all of them, but there's a couple of things you really have to note. And the one I really liked is about living to fight another day. So you have to manage your risk in a proper way to be able to get back the next day. If you have a bad day, a bad week, a bad month, You have to be able to get back. So that's why we talk about risk management a lot. And Paul's experience with veterans and himself in the military really helps to see that picture of living another day. And the other thing I really like is about the importance of following a process. And people in the army are usually good at that. They're able to follow direction. And that's what makes them great traders. But you can implement the same thing, even if you're not in the military. Then we talked about self-awareness, how to debrief. That's crucial. Eliminate hesitation, also crucial. And last thing, try to figure out if you're a fear-based versus greed-based trader. This is going to help you a lot to know what to implement and what you need to focus on at this point. So I'm really glad that this interview was brought up to you. And it's my pleasure, as always, to serve you and do my best to help you out. Connect with me after the show at desartotrade.com forward slash group. And it's going to be my pleasure to interact with you and help you out in any way. If you have any question, send me a message or post in the group there and I'll do my best. Last thing, check out desartistory.com forward slash join academy and you'll be able to see the whole academy that I'm trying to put up out there to help traders and make a difference in your life. So on that note, I'll see you in the next episode of the Desartistory podcast. Ciao. Thanks for listening to the Desire to Trade podcast. To get all the information on this show, free articles, and unique resources, make sure to check out www.desiretotrade.com and subscribe. Please leave us a review and let us know what you thought about the show. It's time to become the best trader you can be. See you next time.